just to welcome everyone to uh, the latest uh, COVID-19 task force event. Uh, this session um, will be looking specifically at virtual working platforms. So this is the latest in a series of uh, weekly sessions that we've run since March, uh, which are designed to help PR professionals navigate the impact of uh, COVID-19. So we're really delighted to be joined by uh, two um, academics uh, from the Middlesex University in Dubai. Uh, we'll, we're joined by Aditi Bhatia, who's a lecturer in psychology, and Stephen King, who's a lecturer in media. And they're going to be talking about self-representation on virtual meeting platforms uh, and looking uh, at sharing the results of a recent global study which uh, explored uh, the phenomenon of, of working from home and, and, and looking into the details of what our backgrounds uh, say about us. So uh, with that in mind, it's, uh, it's over to you, Stephen. Great. Thank you very much, Corey. Now I've got my notepad here, just like we found out from everyone else they all have when they're preparing for these meetings. Uh, so thank you to the to Corre and to the PRCA for hosting and organizing this, uh, especially to Tony, who's the head of the committee, uh, and to Yun He, who's the head of our particular working group and the health and well-being working group. So a really big thank you for hosting this and allowing us this platform to share what we have. Um, uh, I also want to say thank you uh, to my, my colleague there, Aditi, for being with us throughout the whole process, and also the Middlesex uh, Research Committee that is, uh, has helped us with the ethics approvals and for guiding us through all of this particular project. Um, uh, I also would like to say thanks to a friend of ours who is, uh, I'm going to start sharing the, uh, the screen and you'll be able to see the great pictures of our presentation. Uh, this young child here, uh, this is uh, the daughter of a gentleman named Karim Ben Abdullah. And uh, he has done a photo study over the course of the lockdown inside his house and from around about. And he's given us permission to use those images to help illustrate uh, the, the study that we have here. Uh, and finally, as you can see, I'm in a very peculiar place. So I'm at the Selfie Kingdom in Dubai. Uh, which I'm very grateful again to Sharon Fernandez and everyone for for everyone for looking after us here. Uh, this is Van Gogh's bedroom, um, and we picked this particular location because this is what we found when we've been doing our interviews. This is the kind of setup, in a lot less exaggeration, as we have uh, across the field. Um, and you can also see in the backdrop we have our little uh, cat, uh, Linka. This is uh, who we adopted from the Dubai Links Festival of Creativity last year. Uh, but don't worry, she's sleeping now. She won't be coming onto the laptop and disturbing anything. Um, the Selfie Kingdom is a really useful place for us to be because over the course of the study, what we have discovered is that for some people that this has been okay. They have created their own kingdom in their own houses their own selfie kingdom, but for others, it's been a personal hell. And we're going to share some of these uh, findings uh, over the course of the next 30 minutes with the help of my colleagues. So as Corey was saying, just a little bit about us. Uh, I started my career in 1999 at Lewis PR in London, and I moved to Dubai in 2002. I've since worked at Hill and Knowlton, MSNL, uh, Weber, uh, Asda Burson, Marstella. I also had a, a period where I was working freelance and producing uh, video content. And I've been teaching uh, full time for three time for three years, and before that, I was part time uh, here at Middlesex, and I'm currently covering digital media, uh, advertising, PR, and journalism, and product with a focus on digital content creation. And my colleague Aditi, uh, she is a member of the British Psychological Society. Uh, she is uh, has years spent as an actual medical uh, practitioner studying mental health, uh, and so at the moment she's currently teaching both. Uh, positive psychology, um, uh, mental health, and feminism in in the in the in the in, the, in her area. And so I'm, I'm really great that we have a nice combination of PR, digital media content, and with psychology. And that's what's helped to make this presentation and this study uh, come to life. So I'll just allow uh, Aditi to talk us through the methodology. Right. Um, thank you, Steve, for for that introduction. 
Um, what we're presenting today is the findings of our qualitative study. Um, so we were not interested at all in um, in understanding how uh, you know how findings how our findings can be generalized, but rather interested in um, understanding people's experiences and identifying the themes and patterns that we that we're seeing emerge because of the unique situation that we found ourselves in because of the start of the pandemic and how quickly we've all had to adapt to, um, to working in a, in a professional setting, but within our perhaps homes. Um, and so, um, you know, the, the aim of our study uh, is, to, is to understand pe people's experiences so that we can guide future researchers, um, professionals, and how they can potentially best design um, environments in which to uh, to do professional calls. And um, also the study is currently incomplete and um, we're still in the process of, uh, of understanding the data that we've collected and it's not peer reviewed at the moment. Um, all right, so uh, what we're going to do today is first introduce the aims of the study and, and also talk through the methodology of how we went about doing the study. We'll also give you a little bit of an insight into who the sample was um, and all the people who very kindly uh, participated in our study. But we'll spend the majority of our time discussing the findings, the very preliminary findings that we've had so far. And we've already seen really interesting uh, patterns emerge from the data. Um, and, you know, we also have some quotes from our participants to illustrate um, and give examples of some of the things that we've seen. So that's pretty much what we're going to do today. All right. Um, so, um, like I was saying earlier, with the start of the pandemic, we've all had to adapt very quickly. We've had to learn how to use technology, how to how to create a space in our homes to uh, to conduct professional calls. And so, um, we thought that this was a very interesting um, opportunity uh, for scientific exploration to understand um, how people have adapted to this uh, to this situation. And um, as such, uh, we aim to identify the trends in the way that people portray themselves during streamed communications in, uh, in professional settings. And, uh, you know, uh, as a psychologist, it's also very interesting for me to see um, how people present themselves, how they represent their identity or create an identity online, um, and, you know, how they, how they express themselves, and what are the boundaries and challenges of doing so. Um, we're also looking for an in-depth understanding of of um, of people's experiences, like I was saying earlier, um, and you know, we're also interested in exploring other concepts such as how people interact with um, with a so-called imaginary audience, uh, people who they're speaking to on a digital platform but can't really see, um, and all of us have an imagined audience in our head, no matter where we are, even if we're sitting on a park bench, for example. Um, and so, understanding how people present themselves in these settings is uh, is what we're aiming to, to do. All right, and so in order to, um, you know, to fulfill the aim of our research, we were very interested in, in photographs, not just photographs of, uh, of, of things, but of people themselves. And so, um, you know, we feel that photographs can capture um, the elements of a person's identity, but not just their identity, also the spaces and the backgrounds in which they uh, participate in, um, in a professional call. Um, and so, um, you know, we, we tried to use this kind of visual data to, um, to elicit further information, to begin a conversation. And um, for this, we used a methodology called photo elicitation. Now, photo elicitation is, um, is a methodology that's still emerging and developing in the area of psychology and other social sciences. And what we do essentially is we, we used the participant's image, uh, uh, like the one you're seeing of us right now on a Zoom call, and then ask them a series of questions about that image to better understand their opinions about that image. So kind of a very meta perspective on things. Uh, we invited our participants to introspect and reflect on uh, how they present themselves and their backgrounds. And so um, we conducted this photo elicitation interview. And through that, we were able to understand their thoughts and the experiences of that image of themselves. Um, and what we found was a lot of people had, uh, you know, uh, through our questions, they, uh, they had kind of 
um, epiphanies of, uh, you know, oh, I never thought of that or, oh, I didn't think of it this way, kind of really giving them a chance to reflect on how they present themselves and their backgrounds. So, um, Steve, uh, we have some images yep. here. Do you want to explain what they're about? I, and so the origination of the whole study was a... Uh, class meeting that we had on campus, whereas I, I spotted a pattern in the pictures that there was some, some similar happening. We, and if you looked at this iconic picture, which was shared by the UK government earlier in the, in the pandemic, you can perhaps see what I'm talking about. There are pictures in some, there are bookcases in some, there are windows in some, and the idea that these symbols are not uh, accidental, they are deliberate from a PR advertising, from a reputation standpoint, you see these things as being deliberate and from the government you know that these have been positioned and they've put a lot of thought into what they what position they're presenting and so uh, this is what fueled and gave us the excitement to move forward with the research and when we started we looked at random people we were very very uh, very very open with who we spoke to there was really only one criteria that they had to be working during the pandemic period um, we felt that everyone has been trapped indoors in the same way which was what made this study so exciting and so we, we just left it broad we used social media we did a call we did an invitation and we successfully interviewed 31 people now it's interesting that we actually were engaging with four more and those four were unable to complete the interview and those four had something very interesting in common in the fact that they had very large families at the time, we didn't think too much of it, but during the course of the research, or perhaps in a future study, we'll be, we'll be talking about that, I'm sure. Uh, we had 17 nationalities within the study, uh, and 13 different cities were, talked, were, were, were engaged with, and that includes South America, North America, Canada, it includes into Korea, and in India, we have from here in the UE, we talked to Nigeria, we talked to people in India, we talked to people in Tunisia. Uh, we, we've really managed to speak to people across the board, the UK in the Netherlands. Uh, and so we, we've really managed to get what we think is a very broad uh, snapshot of, of what's happened over the first period. We also managed to get a good age stretch uh, from some young just graduates entering the first, entering the world uh, or just finishing a, uh, their, first, their first work up to the eldest who are uh, senior levels of, of, of council. And so we have medical practitioners in here. We have HR professionals. We have content creators, quite a large number of them. Uh, we have some people who work in IT uh, and even some members of NGOs or coaching and mentoring. So it's a very, very broad panel and it's given us some very rich results. Now, where this is just a quick snapshot of the, of the things that will feed into the, the conclusions that we've come. First thing is where people spoke to us from. 18 people spoke to us from their bedroom and 15 of these conversations were from the master bedroom, the most private location. And you can think about that and how, when you invite someone into your house in the real life, where, which rooms you show them and which rooms you don't. And that gives you again, another taster of what's to come. We had eight people in living rooms. There were a lucky few who had special studios. We had one person who was in an office, which was interesting. Uh, and then we also had one person who uh, it spoke to us from their car. We inferred from many of the conversations that we had uh, the status of the household size. So there's married, people would talk about the husbands or their wives or their, the friends that they were living with. Uh, they were talking about their children. They were very open at talking about this. And these factors all feed in again into our success in engaging with them and in the content that we're about to present. Now, in my experience, if something is working, people don't talk about it. If you don't discuss an issue, it's not an issue, it's obviously working well. In practically every single one of our conversations, there was anxiety about internet connection, which implies that globally, the World Wide Web has not been up to the task of everyone being trapped at home during COVID. And as the first quotes that we have here, I think the major issue is that uh, internet is causing trouble for all of us right now. I haven't had a single call where there has not been an issue. I think we've seen that across all uh, territories. We had particular problems 
uh, in emerging markets, as you might imagine, such as Nigeria and Tunisia and India. But we also faced issues in the US and we also had issues in Korea as well. Um, so it's it's not a uh, a one area issue. It's I think this is a it's it's a global concern. It's a global source of anxiety, and there are some implications for that. And one of them is the limited mobility of people. Uh, one of the reasons people were talking in their bedroom or were talking from a specific location is because they had to be close to the Wi-Fi. They had to be close to the internet connection. They were restricted in in what they can show to people behind them because if they didn't have good internet access, obviously the call couldn't happen. So this really put people under a lot of pressure. There's another issue that, have, that was raised, that if you don't have the screen, if you refuse to show your face, um, then you can't create a human connection, you can't create a personal reaction. We are the people living in the screens right now, and this is all the relationship that you can get from someone. Accordingly, if your internet is low, and you're not able to open up, it was discovered and was suggested that you're not as effective as a communicator. Um, there's also effects on personal reputations. People felt this was their home, this is their home internet network, and people were, uh, if the internet is falling down, you can't blame it on your IT manager. This is you, this is your location, this is your facilities. It's a bit like not being able to serve a cup of tea because the kettle's not working. If your internet's not working, some people were saying that this is a similar kind of personal uh, personal problem. And then we have professional reputation. And it was really interesting that we had an, a story from an, an ambassador uh, who was unable to uh, participate in a special online meeting uh, because they didn't have the internet access and it became uh, a speaking point in a particular country. Um, and so these key issues uh, are really ar ar arriving across the board. And in fact, in one extreme case, uh, we had a gentleman who spoke to us within the car uh, because he lives in a developing area uh, where the network wasn't built. You know, you didn't have fiber to the home or fiber to the curb. It hadn't yet reached that particular area. So in order for him to have the video call, he had to drive to, uh, to talk to us in order for him to be composed and for this call to be effective. And that's why he was explained to us to, to be in the car. He has an office, but the network in the office wasn't strong enough for him to guarantee to have an effective conversation. And that's why he spent time driving, I think quite considerable distance and using his mobile data, his GSM data to, uh, to speak to us um, at, his, at his own expense. So we're very grateful for that. Great. Right. Um what also emerged along with this kind of digital um, you know, divide was, uh, was a very virtual representation of privilege. And um, it, it, was, it was, even though there was a spectrum, there was such a clear dichotomy there between those that were privileged that were able to create spaces within their house that best represented them compared to those that were bound by their circumstances, by their living conditions that were, did not have the same level of choice. And so, um, you know, we've picked out some great examples from participant narratives about, uh, about the, like some people experienced a, a clear sense of pride in their background and were just waiting for someone to ask them a question about, hey, what's the thing I see behind you? That looks interesting as a, as a conversation starter. Um, and then, uh, you know, in our interviews, we also ask people about if there, if there's anything they would like to change about their background and those with the backgrounds that were, uh, that had backgrounds that were created to best represent them were the ones who said, oh, I don't want to change anything. Uh, I like the bu bookshelf that I have behind me or the painting that I have behind me that I think is a representation of me. Um, and so, you know, these were the individuals that, that were very well adjusted to this work at home environment, were able to quickly adapt um, and exercise choice in designing their spaces. But the, these were the same individuals that had the privilege, uh, whether it's economic privilege or, um, or you know, space within their house to, to be able to do that. Uh, so, uh, a couple of our participants had elaborate studios in their house, which is, uh, which is a, such a virtual showcase of, uh, of uh, wealth, choice, and space. Um, and that was very interesting. So 
we also had participants who, who had a who had a selection of spaces within their house to choose from and where they wanted to do the cause. Uh, we had one participant who had a family with uh, with a couple of children, and they would say that each person in their house has their own space to do a call. So um, as you can see, the last quote in the choice column says everyone has their own session, then they can go, one person is cooking, one person is learning French, and another person is le learning Arabic, and each person has their own space. So, um, so you know, we, we definitely uh, could notice a very visual difference in privilege. Um, and on the other end of the spectrum were people who uh, who did not have the same kind of choices, who were working on a very survival mode, um, you know, trying to trying to overcome the barriers um, barriers in in their own representation because the things that they might not have chosen to represent about themselves are were now speaking for them. For example, uh, things in their background that they don't have control over. Uh, we spoke to uh, we spoke to a few people who had you know who had children around them uh, or, or pets and interruptions of those kinds, and so these people were working on very basic survival mode. Uh, their their priorities were about privacy and protection, um, and you know and their their whole environment was designed as a compromise or an adjustment to working from home that that did not have a lot of choice in it. And so we had uh, participants who, whose physical mobility was restricted because they couldn't move out of the room. Um, or, you know, we had, we had a few people who were doing their interviews from their bed, which is such a personal space, as you were saying earlier, Steve. Um, and so, you know, it, to be able to protect themselves from, uh, from the audience that they were interacting with in these professional calls was, was an important concern because a lot of us work in environments where our privacy is, is essential. Um, and so, you know, we also noticed people who were completely helpless, like, how do I deal with the lights? How do I deal with my messy room? There were so many people who talked about wishing that they had a bigger space, wishing they could make some changes, but also understanding that this is challenging because it comes at a cost. Um, and a lot of our participants expressed, um, you know, feelings of being really careful uh, about what they're showing about themselves. So that was a of a lot of importance. And it's quite clearly represented in this quote that we're just about to see from one of the participants. It says, you know, people have uh, good backgrounds that they're comfortable with, but there are others who don't. And it affects the way that you are involved in a certain meeting. For example, you know, Steve and I are both, uh, uh, teaching is an important part of our job. And if we don't have good environments in which we can interact with large classes, then we might not want to do that. Um, and so, uh, you know, some people prefer to keep their videos off because they feel uh, almost a sense of shame of, uh, with their backgrounds and what they're presenting because that's not their choice. So, um, so this, this is very clear kind of, you know, divide that we noticed. Obviously the next step but after internet and perhaps on privilege and wealth is security. So that did also come up and there's some very interesting uh, stories here. Uh, Again, we don't share our mobile numbers or other personal details, but we're letting in an entire audience into our house. They can see everything. Uh, one gentleman was said that it's safer for his family that people can't see what's going on around him. And he's very happy with that, that his background was very uh, anonymous. Um, and the, the, a positive element of the virtual backgrounds, we'll talk about virtual backgrounds in more detail later on, is that if you can put a virtual background up, that is a protective shield that is protecting your security. There are other elements of home security that we haven't put up here, so we're smaller, perhaps outliers. One of them is we're using a lot more electronic devices at home. And in some countries and in some cities, the electricity in the house isn't very strong. And so if we have lights like what I have on here, plus new sound system and computers and everyone's got one in their own room, you're putting an extra load on the household electricity, potential for electric fires maybe. Uh, there was another issue that came up there about people who have uh, disabilities around the house, having more people at the home, having more equipment in the home, uh, limited the mobility and potentially created additional risks there. Um, and then we have the cyber security side, which is perhaps what most people will be thinking about with this element. Um, and there have been issues, which we're highlighting here. One, where you had an open seminar where anyone could come and just register and sign in. And in one particular public event, a stalker showed up. 
and was able to continue to plague the chief guest. And afterwards, they discovered he was a stalker because he admitted to having some mental health issues. Um, uh, there's companies which are really taking this into, into special consideration now. Uh, in some companies, they're not allowing video at all. So they've completely removed video chat because they're so paranoid about what might be shown within the office or within the home of the individual, particularly if they are working on uh, particularly um, uh, sensitive issues. Uh, and then we have the, again, another public forum similar to this, where you're at risk of the event itself being hacked. It's a new element of crisis management. What do you do if you've just organized one of these electronic systems and someone, one of these electronic conferences, and someone has just decided, I'm gonna come in and I'm gonna cause trouble. And there's a lot of different tools that we can use uh, for positive benefits on these virtual calls, but those can be turned against you if the hackers are able to somehow gain control. Um, and that's a, an emerging risk area which people perhaps in the PR industry we need to consider as they're organizing events moving forward. This next slide is gonna cause some of you a little bit of a huh moment. Yeah, I'm deliberately not saying anything there. I think that's a very powerful statement. I'm sure there's families and there who are, are thinking this right now. I don't want strangers to know about what's going on in my house or where I live or this would be a bit a uh, bit uh, happy, I think, in the initial phase. And I think the realization of what is actually being shared might well be coming out and we'll be looking at changes uh, in how people portray themselves in the future. Okay, uh, a slightly more fun uh, topic, unintended audiences. I mentioned the cat earlier, um, but there are other, as well as pets, children are key. We do see a lot of children, uh, especially plaguing the father, not so much the mother, but the father, because the father's home for the first time and they, they want to be with him. And so there's a lot of stories in the future study, we're going to be looking at the tribulations of fatherhood, uh, working at home. But the fathers apparently have had a much worse time than the mothers. Um, and so you notice in the first slide that there is a lot of childcare fathers are adapting to having to child look after the children and, and their environment where they're working generally has children uh, around them and they're having to, to, to just adapt. And in some cases, the work itself is having to adapt. In one case, uh, an entire monthly or weekly review session had to be canceled because the f children from different families kept interrupting the call from one set for another. So they, they stopped that whole uh, meeting process. Uh, another thing perhaps that we don't consider if we're in the Western world is if you have an elderly relative uh, staying with you or an extended family member, that this room that is given to the extended family member may also become the place where is most suitable to do video calls. And so uh, in one particular instance, we discovered that there was an elderly mother who would be in the bed alongside uh, the video call that was taking place. And I'm sure you've probably all gone straight to faux pas and read these funny three stories. We've obviously had people coming in and saying, hey, I'm on the call, Are you, you know, distracting. Uh, if you don't tell people exactly what's going on or you don't lock the doors, so many people have done. Uh, some people have created WhatsApp groups on the families. You know, so they, even though they live and confined in the same place, they're just sending a group WhatsApp so that everyone has the message that there's something going on. But again, then there's other issues uh, such as uh, uh, catching a, a lady uh, breastfeeding on the camera from behind. So you'd be speaking to the husband and the, the lady not understanding what is going on, perhaps because this has not happened before, they don't have the work in the house, they just continue as normal. And then we have other situations which have been reported to us where the, the, the disclosure of a partner in the, in the bed at an early morning call, which is also uh, something which is before power, which is being disclosed. And the story of pets, this is uh, our third researcher, Olivia, the little cat that sometimes comes and enters into our interviews. Um, and there has been a wide discussion of pets, to, just to make this section a bit more fun. Uh, some people think cats are very, you're either a cat person or you're not. It's, that's it. Some people love to see cats come in. They think it's quite funny. It breaks up the conversation. It brings nature in the room. Uh, other people are quite uh, nervous about the whole thing and lock them away. I think uh, it depends on whether your audience is a cat people or not, or, or, or what the formality is, but the court is out uh, on, on pets 
And I think it's, there's a 50-50 in our panel on whether pets should be allowed uh, in the room with you. <laughs> yes, I'm continuing. Virtual backgrounds. Uh, so uh, this is another topic which is being talked about, but is less contra less um, less than pets. Um, people don't like virtual backgrounds in a professional setting. It's widely regarded as a little bit naff, as a little bit. Mm. a little bit immature um, it's useful in terms of team building and for internal and informal meetings okay uh, and for celebrating birthdays at this point in time so instead of the gathering where everyone comes together and cuts the cake and sings happy birthday people have been using these virtual backgrounds to celebrate and as a way of, of maintaining the camaraderie and that has been considered quite positive However, uh, in other places, uh, it's seen as being inauthentic. It's, about, it's a hindrance to the communication. Um, it's about earlier on when we talked about how you're not being able to create a, uh, a, a positive connection with the person behind the screen. If you're not showing something, then you're being a little bit, um, you're, you're hiding yourself. You're not being as transparent. And people don't warm to that as much as if they can see uh, the, the real you. And so the, there's a thought process that goes in there that if you have these virtual backgrounds, you're closing yourself off um, from, from the, the, the person who you're trying to build a relationship or build a rapport with. Uh, there's also people give a lot of, uh, you, you, if you put a virtual background, you create an opportunity for people to laugh at you, they, to ridicule you. There's many stories here uh, about, uh, they think uh, it's superfluous, this person is flippant. Um, if they're sitting on the bridge in the US, there's something sticking out of their head. If you go back to the slide earlier, which I shared with the government's uh, pictures, you'll notice that one of the ladies had a flag, had the Union Jack sticking out the top of her forehead. Um, so uh, being careful about what's around you and what's positioned is, is very, very important. And if you put one of these environments, which is odd and which is unusual, you will be con personally considered a little bit less serious than if you just had a play in the background. Uh, one really important statement that someone made was that these virtual backgrounds give to those people who perhaps can't afford uh, bookcases and studies and what have you, uh, extra anxiety about their wealth and their status in life and that they should be investing in this kind of uh, decoration even when they, you know, there are other things that they need right here and right now. So the Zoom backgrounds can be positive if it's for fun, if it's for team building and camaraderie, or for protecting your safety and security, but it can also make you look uh, flippant. It might also uh, make you look less transparent, and the Zoom backgrounds might give people greater anxiety uh, and pressure them to purchase things which they don't actually require. Uh, this is one quote from uh, one of the guests, one of the participants uh, that sums it up. They seem very artificial, almost alien-like. They can be a distraction if you try and have a conversation with someone. If the logo is right behind them, it's, it's distractive. Many people that we spoke to have said, but we just want a plain background, just a plain background. Focus on my face, focus on my content. Don't look behind me. Um, there's another one. So it, the, the, the medium of this is, is, is replacing the face-to-face -face contact. So if you've got this unusual artificial background, then the person that you're dealing with is, is considered to be less real and more uh, of a just, just a character on the screen, on a TV screen. Right. Um, we were fortunate enough to interview a lot of people uh, from, from a variety of different cultures, uh, different countries uh, where they were living. And uh, we were exposed to a lot of diverse values and, uh, and cultural practices within these virtual presentations of people. Uh, and it gave us a chance to understand the role that culture plays in self-representation and how cultural values are translated when someone is in a professional, uh, you know, virtual environment. And so um, we had somebody, um, uh, one of our participants was uh, joining in from India and they referred to um, Vastu, which is a, you know, ancient Hindu science about how a, a house should be designed and where a person should sit and how that plays a role in where they're sitting down in their own house. 
we had we had a couple of people who took a lot of sense uh, you know who, uh, a lot of pride in the way they were able to dress and present themselves to represent their culture uh, the gentleman who we spoke to from uh, nigeria was was very happy to show us the dress that he was wearing that represented his culture um, and uh, we also found very interesting um, narratives such as um, uh, someone from the uae who uh, who decided uh, you know how to how to dress or make slight variations in their dressing based on whether there was a female person in the audience or not, and so um, it, it goes to show how much thought some people put into the way they're dressed and the way they present themselves based on who is looking at them, um, and you know some people were, were uh, took it to the next step and wanting to almost uh, present their country or their their uh, you know the the best aspects of the city that they live in uh, within their backgrounds to, to kind of show off a part of themselves um, based on where they come from so that was quite interesting and um, along with culture we were also uh, you know uh, we were also able to understand some of the values that people brought with them to these environments and you know as a psychologist again uh, people's personal values and ethics are, are are really important to me and because they it shapes the the world view of people not just in how they see the world but also how they think others perceive them so um, you know we 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 noticed some very interesting things. For example, the first couple of quotes are from uh, from uh, from psychotherapists, um, and in psychotherapy, you know, uh, a lot of our effort goes into to not having a kind of hierarchy between the therapist and the client. And so um, the the therapists wanted to recreate that environment in which the hierarchy wasn't very blatant. And I think the same applies to, to others, to a, a variety of other professions like teaching, uh, where we want to make sure that, that the uh, hierarchy is not presented in this virtual um, you know, meeting platform. So there was a lot of range of values. A lot of people also focused on authenticity and trying to be as authentic as they can. However, what we found very fascinating was that despite despite presenting as or trying to present as authentic the authenticity itself was created um you know so the backgrounds were created to represent that authenticity and that brings into question whether it is authentic authentic in the first place or not and so um you know some of our other participants were um, were were very you know cognizant of not judging people based on what they saw because they would understand that the backgrounds that people are in are not necessarily a representation of themselves. And so, um, you know, for, for many people, it was just about just clarity, just delivery. It was about, you need to see me, not my background, and that's more important. So again, lots of diverse values, but what we did find consistently was that people brought their values with them um, on this virtual platform. So that was, definitely interesting and so, uh, sorry um, and along with um, you know kind of just summarizing all of the things that we noticed all of the themes that we saw um, I'm sure um, many of us are familiar with Maslow's hierarchy of needs so here we've created a Stephen Aditi's uh, streaming hierarchy of needs uh, and obviously number one is internet and access to a, a, a fast, a good internet connection that was just the most basic necessity for all of our participants. And we found a lot of participants did not have access to this very basic need. Um, and you know, as as we will go down uh, this list, you will see things that are important, but increasingly less important and more choice based. So security was a very important concern for a lot of people. Um, being able to have a private space to do calls without any interruptions and um, tidiness was very important. Uh, almost all of our participants said that before they join a call, they make sure that the space behind them is tidy enough so that people don't think they're, they're, um, they're really you know, dirty or unclean people. But then it wasn't just the tidiness in the background, but a few participants also spoke about the, the space that they can see when they're on, on a call. So like if someone's on a bed, then the bed around them, if someone's on a table, then the table around them, and how that also needed to be tidy uh, or else it would be distracting to them while they're on a call. 
and um, and so it's it's more than just the visible space that needs to be tidy. And then, of course, there's the there's the matter of space um, uh, and the and the need to have a space dedicated to your work inside your home and how important that is for many people. And then, of course, childcare. Uh, or for many people, this is the most basic basic need as well. Um, I, I've, I've spoken to people who, um, you know, if there's a, a a couple in which both the father and the mother are, are working, then they they have to work in shifts at home because uh, the children need to be taken care of, and so these kind of concerns become really important um, when working from home. And then after those needs, people start looking for um, things that are going to make their experience nicer and the most in demand item is good light whether it's natural light or artificial light that i'm enjoying uh, right here right now in one country in mexico uh, the the small led lights have risen and rocketed in price by three times uh, since the start of the pandemic uh, which is quite a significant price because people realize that this is all you get right now. And if I'm having a first impression, I need my face to look good for you so that I'm giving a good impression. So lights, uh, as narcissistic as it might sound, is unfortunately the number one thing that uh, we've, we've seen in people's wish lists moving forward after they've got the top five. Uh, bookcases, even from people who don't read books, uh, people have just seen, perhaps they've seen images like we've seen from, from the government picture before and seen people with bookcases, bookcases maybe equal knowledge, bookcases wealth or what have you, but they see there's a trend for people to put books and bookcases behind them. Uh, comfort is interesting, ergonomics, people uh, are starting to see, I've lifted my laptop up today, so it's quite high, so it's, it's easy for me to see the screen uh, and the people are investing in chairs to make their, because when they're at home, they, they don't have the facilities to, to, uh, to be comfortable as if they would in the office. This ergonomic type of investments that they've had from HR, they're now looking to invest back at home. Organization, uh, notebooks in particular, uh, uh, everyone has, but filing systems just to make sure that everything is close so that when you're on the business call, you don't have to keep wandering around backwards and forwards uh, to, to bring all the papers together. And after all of this, people are starting to invest in plants, demonstrating their arts uh, and undertaking hobbies. But <laughs> I think this is our last uh, discussion slide. There is also risk. And uh, to finish on this, we're talking about there's two different areas of risk, personal risk and professional risk. Um, this is my first impression with many of the people on the stage that I'm, I'm, I'm speaking to right now. This is the only chance I get to build a relationship with you. I have to make sure that what I'm conveying is perfect. And if I'm showing you my house, I want to make sure that you see that I have a well curated house. Um, uh, because I don't want to leave that impression of something going wrong with you. Okay. Um, there's some people who just have moved around from just when they first started this whole procedure, they just thought, right, they just put their laptop wherever and, and just show. But it has become increasingly um, prevalent over the course of time that people realize that they actually need to do some work in how they're presenting themselves. And every single person that we spoke to has some form of cleaning, dressing ritual, and that they're all preparing themselves as if they were going to work uh, for, for any kind of professional meeting. And then there's also the case of professional images. So people who are in the content industry or uh, people who are in consulting, they need to show that they know what's going on. And so if you're in a content creation you, and you're going to be on the video call, your video content has got to be perfect. It's got to be like you are in a studio because that's, that's the kind of work that you're in. Uh, and then there's another thought that if you're consulting and you've got a client, uh, you don't want to show mess or disruption or the fact that you're in some form of distress because that might create anxiety in the client or give them an excuse to delay a check or to uh, ask for uh, some form of, of financial penalty. So there's, there's professional image and then there's professional image risk factors from not having made these investments that we talked about. Uh, and so finally, as a final quote, this is something which is spiritual values based to, to think about. We're also conditioned by what we see on social media, from PR, from advertising, we're all being conditioned um, to do certain things and to live in certain ways. 
And the, the values that we see from our audience, from people that we've spoken to, is that we shouldn't be making these judgments. We need to stop. We need to try to realize that we're all in this boat together and that what we're seeing is, 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 is only a picture. It's not the whole story and uh, that we should never judge a book by the cover. However, we're in advertising and PR, so it's very likely that many of the commercial entities will be looking at these anxieties. And we might see advertising images um, being used to, to tap into some of these concerns that we've raised. But ultimately, uh, that's the end of our part two, our part one. And Aditi might give you a little trailer for what you might expect when we move forward with this research. Yeah, so, um, you know, from whatever we've found already, we see a lot of interesting directions that, that we can go in and, and other researchers can go in. And I think one of the most important things is the lessons that we've learned from this particular transition and how we can better prepare ourselves for situations like this that arise in the future. Um, and and, and there, there really is so much to learn from, from what we've already found. Um, there's a lot of interesting stuff that we, we haven't discussed today, but we are still understanding better is the way in which gender roles were presented um, in, inside the house, how people divided spaces between the house, um, experiences of fatherhood, um, as Steve mentioned earlier, because a lot of fathers were at home for this much time for the very first time in their lives. And so how, how that would impact um, you know, their experiences of fatherhood in the long term. And the kind of stresses that modern family experiences and is experiencing in the current work uh, environment that we're in. We're also very interested in, in, in understanding more deeply the kind of virtual identity that is created on these platforms and what that looks like. And, and perhaps, you know, from a, from a psychological perspective, developing a theory of, of, of identity. And also um, doing further analysis and understanding the meanings, uh, semiotic analysis, discourse analysis, the way, in pe uh, the way in which people talk about themselves and, and their environments and how that reveals something about them. Uh, we're also interested in, in research around avatars and what might be the, uh, the kind of best way to be in a virtual background uh, according to according to several people because everyone has a different uh, understanding of what is best um, and and last but not least um, you know understand performed identities how people uh, perform their identity in a virtual uh, space and what that means for our overall identities in general there's so many parts to each person's self what they bring to a virtual background and what they don't is equally interesting um, and so we, we're very excited to, to see where this goes. Steve, is there anything else you'd like to add? Uh, no, I just think we have enough content here which we could go on for hours. And I just like to thank <laughs> everyone again for participating and staying with us through that talk. Uh, we hope it was of interest. Thank you everyone for, for showing up. And for, our, for those of you who are in the panel, I uh, hope that we've done our best in, in translating what you said to us. Uh, so thank you very much for showing up to here as well. Uh, and if there is any more for questions, we will have them take them. Thank you. Stephen and Aditi, thank you both so much for that. That was um, absolutely fascinating. And I'm sure, I, I, I'm sure our audience uh, uh, got plenty to take away from that. I think we're all, we're all such uh, in a position where we're completely working in a, in a new environment in a new way and a lot of the issues and themes that you've raised will, uh, will be of, of far more importance in the future than they have been in the recent past. So it's brilliant to get ahead of the trends and, and we'd just like to thank you for your, for your time and for your research and, and for sharing those lessons today and look forward to uh, the next parts of the research that Aditi has, has highlighted and it'll be great to hear more about those in future as well. Brilliant. To everyone else, uh, thank you all for joining us. This session will be available uh, like all the others on our YouTube channel, so do keep an eye out on there and we'll be announcing the details of next week's session uh, in our emails in the next few days. So do keep an eye on our usual channels and, uh, and we'll be in touch soon.